Mikhail Gorbachev is one of the most important figures of the 20th century. A child of the Soviet Union and a fast-rising star in the Communist Party, Gorbachev was also a democratizer whose reforms led to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Today's guest has authored the definitive biography of the last Soviet leader. He's William Taubman this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by William Taubman, the Bertrand Snell Professor of Political Science Emeritus at Amherst College. A winner of the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Nikita Khrushchev, his latest book is a biography of former Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev. Bill, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Glad to be with you. So you describe uh, Gorbachev's life uh, in just beautiful, exquisite detail. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some specific questions I want to ask you about what he did while he was premier and why he did it. But tell us about the events that made Gorbachev the man he became. Well, actually, in my book, which is a full biography, I argue that you have to understand his childhood and his years at Moscow University and his climbing the greasy pole in Stavropol, a city in southern Russia, and then the seven years in Moscow before he was chosen. But once he gets into power, um, at first he's highly popular. It looks as if everybody loves him, and then he begins to carry out reforms, and then he begins to transform communism, and by the time he's forced out in 1991, he is widely despised, and to this very day, he remains despised in his own country. Is there a moment, though, is there something in his youth that explains why he became a reformer? Well, he grew up in the terrible 1930s when there was famine, there were purges, both of his grandfathers were arrested. He saw close up the reality of Stalinist countryside, which was a far cry from the propaganda to which he himself was subjected in school. So in that sense, he knew very early on that much of what was printed and argued and said was a lie. And I think that lay at the bottom of his determination, if he ever got a chance, to try to change things. Is it, but is it, is it, is it, is it just personal integrity? It's, it is partly personal integrity. He's a unique man. He was a unique leader. A lot of people who grew up under the same circumstances turned out to be lackeys and functionaries. Uh, he had a sense not only of himself as worthy and capable of doing great things, but of the system that needed great change. Did that come from a mentor in his, his early life, from his parents, from schoolmates? Where did that come from? You, you, you make the very good point that so many people of that generation did not become a Gorbachev or think like a Gorbachev. He had a rare upbringing. His father, according to his testimony, but others as well, was a wonderful man who encouraged him, who fostered his education, a, a man barely educated himself. He had wonderful grandparents who thought he was the, uh, the most marvelous thing on earth. I think all of this gave him a sense that he was special, that he was good, that he could be confident, that he might, as I said before, do great things. So, so his parents and grandparents would have had the longer view of history having grown up during Tsarist Russia. So they would have that context and also the Bolshevik Revolution. Yes, but I don't think that they were his political tutors. Okay. They didn't teach him to see through the system, although when his grandfather was, came back from the gulag after having been arrested, he spent one night telling his grandson and the rest of the family about how he was tortured in prison. 
and after that he never spoke of it. Really? But can, you can imagine a, an eight-year-old listening to the story of how his beloved grandfather was tortured and drawing certain conclusions without being told to. So do you have a sense of where his political education did come from? Well, it came from the university. Moscow University, which was the best university in the Soviet Union and probably still is in Russia. There were professors at that university who'd been trained before 1917. Gorbachev entered it in 1950. Uh, there were professors who'd been trained in the 20s before Stalinism really cracked down. And there were wonderful fellow students who formed a kind of cell of doubters. Uh, his most uh, his favorite friend at the university was a Czech student who by 1968 was Alexander Dubček's right-hand man during the Prague Spring. Now yeah, this that, guy... That blew my mind when I read yeah, that. This guy in 1950 was not yet what he would become wow. in 1968. <clears throat> but I learned enough about him to know that he too saw through Stalinism. He was a kind of idealistic communist. Um, so by the time Gorbachev left Moscow University, he was not a dissident, you couldn't be in those days, but he was a doubter. Well, so there's a moment that you describe where uh, Gorbachev uh, and uh, the then party boss in Georgia, Edward Shevardnadze, are walking, strolling along the Black Sea. Yes. And Shevardnadze turns to, to Gorbachev and says, you know, everything's rotten. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him. Yes. Right? Uh, and Gorbachev says in return, we can't go on living like this. So what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the fact that by 1985, when Gorbachev becomes the leader, the system has, has sort of become stagnant. It's been corrupt. As Solzhenitsyn once said, the ideology was dead. Nobody believed Marxism-Leninism anymore. But it was still guiding their hands of the government because everybody had to pretend that they believed it. So it, it was rotten. The system was rotten. I think Gorbachev used that same word. Did he have any interaction with Trotsky, who, of course, was banished from, uh, from the Soviet Union, spent his life in Mexico, where he was killed by a Stalinist No, he didn't, goon. because Trotsky, I forget the year Trotsky was assassinated in Mexico, but I think it was in the 30s. Yeah. And was, Gorbachev yeah. born only in 1931. Did, but, did he have any views on Trotsky? Well, I am pretty sure that when Gorbachev and his friends sat around at the university and talked quietly with the door closed, yeah. and I would have said with a pillow on the phone, except there was no phone in the <laughs> dorm rooms, that I, I know that they talked, for example, about the fact that Lenin had, had rivals whom he uh, tolerated whereas Stalin had them exiled or killed, including Trotsky. So, so this is my question. Was Gorbachev, so he's, he climbs the career in, in the Communist Party. He is, uh, uh, I think we would call him today a hard charger, right? Um, yes. Did he always have in his mind that he was going to change the Soviet system? I did don't he want to, ref was, that, was that part of what animated him? I don't think he had in his mind until later on that he wanted to transform the system. But I'm sure he had in mind that the system was rotten and needed reform. Yeah. Um, and when he began the reforms and they didn't take hold or they failed to produce the results or they were resisted by the, the communist hardliners, then he came to the conclusion that the transformation, which he might have imagined but never took seriously, had become essential, and he began to transform the country. Did, did he have any concern for his own well-being? I mean, we know yes, well he, what Stalin and, and Stalinists did. Well, he, to, was no, he was no longer afraid of being liquidated. He wasn't? But he, no. Not he, even by some rogue actor or some... Well, he was once shot at, but... Uh, really? But his, most, his greatest fear was that the hardliners in the Communist Politburo would do to him what they had done to Khrushchev. Khrushchev had been a reformer in the 1950s and right. 60s, and he was ousted in 1964 in a kind of palace coup. And we know, I know, my wife and I talked to Gorbachev. We had eight long interviews with him, two hours each. Wow. And he talked early on about how he was always concerned that Khrushchev's fate would turn out to be his. And as a result, he, he thought, I'm not sure he knew this was Machiavelli's advice, but he was following it because he kept his friends closer, but his enemies 
the ones he, free, he, would, he feared would oust him, even closer. And this, in a way, backfired because he kept them so close that his liberal allies, Gorbachev's liberal allies, concluded that he was eventually in the pocket of his rivals, his hardliners. And they began to abandon him, the liberals. Meanwhile, the hardliners had never been deceived. They knew that he was ruining their country as they saw it. So in the end, he was isolated. So I, I have to ask, yes. eight interviews, two hours each, another contact. How did you get that kind of access? Here you, you're an American, you're a professor, <laughs> well, which is a great thing, but you're an American. How did you get this access? Well, I had, written, this a, access? I had written this biography of Khrushchev. Yeah. The Pulitzer uh, Prize winning biography. Yes, yeah, so we need to note that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how much that counted with Gorbachev. But <laughs> counts for us. Yeah, <laughs> it does. But I, uh, uh, when I got the idea of writing about Gorbachev, by that point, I had gotten to know a man who worked closely with Gorbachev in power and then afterwards. And I asked him if he would tell Gorbachev that I wanted to write this book. I decided I would not ask Gorbachev's permission because he might say no. So instead, I, he would inform Gorbachev that Taubman wanted to write this biography and <laughs> has asked for his support. And Gorbachev said, yes, I will support. And I sent him... Well, the first thing I sent him was a copy of the Khrushchev book in English. And then I sent him a copy of the Russian translation. And he doesn't read English, so he didn't read that. But he did read the Russian, and he came up to me when I saw him next, which was actually the first time, Gorbachev, seeing him personally. And he clapped me on the arm, and he said, good, solid book. <laughs> now, in as, English? <laughs> did he say it in no, English? No, in Russian. In Russian, okay. But as a college professor, I've come to know that the, f that the praise good solid book means it's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so a, I, I had to figure out what that That's a meant. remarkable story. And, and it turns out, as we learned from a lot of his aides, that he didn't like to praise people. He was very chary with his praise. So, so obviously you're there as a professional with, with these eight interviews and other yes. contact. Did, was there a personal connection that also developed in that process? I mean, I have found in, in stories I do where you interview someone repeatedly, eventually, sometimes soon, sometimes later, there's a personal connection. Well, I think it was a personal connection, and it helped that my wife, who taught Russian for f 45 years at Amherst, was with me. Because I think that evoked for Gorbachev a kind of image of his own marriage, which was a wonderful marriage, two devoted people who loved each other. His wife later died early in 1999. Uh, we also were rather tactical about our first interview because we've been told by somebody that you have one interview, but you can't guarantee that you're going to have more. So we figured out how to make that more likely. The first thing I did was I phrased every question that I asked him in language that he himself had used. I said, you once said this, you once wrote this. And the idea was, A, to prove that I'd done my homework, and B, to keep him from simply repeating what he had already said that I quoted to him. And the other thing was, we knew he can be long-winded. We assumed he'd want to get to the period when he was in power. So we started with his grandparents in the 30s. And sure enough, after two hours, we'd gotten to 1948. <laughs> So it gave him an incentive to see us again. Yeah, you, you got to come back. And we came back seven times. So the, 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 you know, the, the book is Gorbachev, His Life and Times. Uh, you know, thinking about that period in the 1980s, uh, you know, I grew up a child of the Cold War, had nightmares of bombs dropping in my backyard. Uh, I, I think that, you know, th th there was so much uh, mythology around uh, the Soviet Union and Soviet military power and their subversive intentions all over the world that when the first time you heard the word glasnost or perestroika, it was sort of like, well, those are happy Russian words. Um, Talk about his impact on the politics of the West and his relationship in particular with Ronald Reagan. Well, you know, I, he had a summit with Reagan in Geneva in November 1985, and I watched on television the coverage of a press conference. And I remember words that convinced me. I, I wasn't sure who Gorbachev was going to turn out to be at that time. But he said the following sentence. He said, we are convinced that our Soviet security depends on you Americans feeling secure too. That was a sea change because the assumption had always been we Soviets are, are secure only if you are insecure. Yeah. That was an example of, of what convinced me.
Uh, but another thing that convinced us, my wife and I, we were living in, in Moscow in 1988 for five months doing research. Uh, and we saw a film that had come out. It was by a Georgian director, and it was about Stalinism. And it said things, it showed things that just took our breath away. We couldn't believe that they had put this on a screen and allowed people to see it. And our Russian friends, of whom we had quite a few, said, many of them said, this does it for us. Now we know for sure. So there were many things that he did and said that added up to the fact that he was different and he was not only a reformer, but was eventually going to change the system. I don't, I don't want to finish talking about the book, but you talk about sort of the, the recalibration of the historical memory of Stalin in Gorbachev's era. In contrast today, the current Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has done a lot to try to uh, resurrect the reputation of yes, Stalin. Yeah. What does that tell us? Well, Putin is trying to build the legitimacy of himself and his regime by linking it to the Russian past and its glories. And Stalin, we don't think of as glorious, but in Russian mind, he won World War II. Yeah. It takes a little bit of a critical mind to remember how many innocent Russians perished. Millions. Under Stalin. Millions. And, it, and in war, as a result of his crazy, reckless um, management of the war. But Putin tries to associate himself with czars uh, and, and with Soviet leaders insofar as they can perform this function for him. You mentioned Reagan. I want yeah, to get yeah. back for that. This is one of the miracles that I try to talk about in the book. Reagan is the arch-conservative American president. Yeah. Gorbachev is the communist leader. Reagan has for four years been raging against communism, evil empire, Star Wars regime, you know, defenses to stop it. And then he becomes Gorbachev's friend. And you have to ask yourself why. And one answer is that Reagan apparently had a strategy, which was to scare them first and then negotiate them with them. Another reason is that he and Gorbachev shared a belief in abolishing nuclear weapons, which relatively few of their advisors actually shared. And the third reason is they liked each other. When they met, you could see that. Um, they resembled each other in certain ways. They liked each other. and. And Reagan, unlike the current American president, who cites Reagan so often, uh, was willing to break with the mold, to change what he'd been doing, to reach out and make a, a deal. Did you know? So you know, the the I've read more about the American team around President Reagan at Reykjavik, mm -hmm. where uh, you know they send the aides out of the room and gets the Gorbachev and Reagan and some translators, and, and Reagan says, "Well, let's just get rid of them all." I, I, I visited the room in, in Reykjavik where they negotiated, Hofti House, and the room where this huh. was said. And and the, I, the American advisors freaked out. This yes. was this was you know this was this was a nightmare scenario because this was not something they were prepared to actually go they forward. They came on. An, an inch within an inch of, of agreeing to abolish nuclear weapons. Was this was there a similar panic uh, in the in the Soviet establishment types of, like, similar to what Reagan's team had? I think the answer is yes. Yeah, they wouldn't have admitted there was they were panicking to their boss, but they were used to relying on nuclear deterrence. So, so go back to what you just said. Yes. They came within an inch. Well, the the trans on that. What happened was they're they're talking in this room: Reagan, Gorbachev, Schultz, uh, Shevardnadze, and they've been debating SDI, and Reagan's been making concessions, and Gorbachev's been making concessions, and suddenly I think it is. Well, I don't remember whether it's Gorbachev or Ray. You may remember it, better. It might, be Gor it might have been Gorbachev. One of them says, yeah. well, let's get rid of nuclear weapons. And George Shultz, who's standing there, says, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you wow. think the next line is going to be, OK, how are we going to do it? But somehow or other, it doesn't happen. This is in the very last meeting at Reykjavik. And Reagan wants to go home. Yeah. It's almost over. He wants to go home, um, in part because Nancy Reagan wasn't with him. Jack Matlock, the American ambassador who knew Reagan very well and Nancy, says if Nancy had been there, Reagan might have wanted to stay an extra day. And if they'd stayed an extra day, who knows what they would have agreed wow. upon. So is there a link, though, so between, you know, Gorbachev is advancing this agenda uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union. Is there a link, though, between this, this desire for more peaceful relationship with the West and his domestic reforms? Absolutely. They're, inextricably linked because Gorbachev knows 
that as long as the Soviet Union is involved in a Cold War with the United States, that his colleagues will insist and he will feel he has to refrain from reform which would deep destabilize a country while it's in this conflict. He, in order to cut the defense budget, he has to reduce the tensions. In order to change the system, he has to reassure people that the world, to uh, not paraphrase Wilson, but to alter Wilson is, Woodrow Wilson is safe for Soviet transformation. We're often struck by how the likability factor, for lack of a better yes. word, <clears throat> how two people hit it off can actually influence sometimes very profoundly world events. And you just gave an example. There seems to be that likability factor now between our current president and Vladimir Putin. What do you make of that? First of all, is it real? Do they really like each other? Do you have a sense of that? And second of all, what is each trying to achieve with that sort of fraternal relationship? I think it's possible that Trump likes Putin. I think it's unlikely that Putin likes Trump. Not for the reasons that many people in this country dislike Trump, but that Putin, Putin is a cynical former KGB agent who does what he needs to do to advance his and his country's interests as he understands them. And I think they spotted, the, the Soviet secret services spotted Trump years ago when they realized he wanted to do business with them in Moscow and realized that they could do favors for him which he might return long before they imagined he would run for president or become president. But as that began to happen, they could see that this could pay off in a big way. Uh, what they did, you know, in the way of favors, I'm not going to cite the, the, the famous, what was it, report, the, uh, the, the uh, British, the steel report. Oh, steel dossier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't go into that. But this is standard Soviet procedure to spot easy marks whom they attempt to use, possibly to blackmail. So that's the way I see what they've been doing. Now, they have a political reason for doing it, too, once he becomes president, because they would like to get him to agree to that Russian troops can stay in eastern Ukraine, or they'd like him to accept the annexation of Crimea. They've got political reasons, too. Now, what about Trump? Well, I, <laughs> I have read the Mueller report. I have to tell you, I read the Mueller report, but it's still a bit of a mystery as to exactly what he is hoping to get from them. Uh, probably, you know, he, he's right. I, I said this the other day at Salve. Trump is right when he says there's, the tensions between Russia and America are higher than they ought to be. They should be reduced, if at all possible. So let's give him the possible credit of saying that that's what he wants to do together with Putin. The irony of all of this is that Trump has become to seem such a stooge of Putin that the American politics won't allow him to negotiate a reduction of tensions which he may want to achieve. It's sort of the old adage, Nixon had, only Nixon could go to China, only Reagan could negotiate yeah. an arms control reduction with, with Gorbachev. I want to come back to that moment in 1989 where uh, uh, Gorbachev visits Beijing. Uh, yes. In the midst of the pro-democracy protests, mm -hmm. weeks before uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. No, he was, he was you know, shortly before. Right. And his arrival, uh, I remember the way the American media portrayed it, was it's self-transformational, that, that the Soviet premier had become a champion of democratization. The people in Tiananmen Square wanted to meet with Gorbachev, and they kept passing the word that they'd like to meet with him. But he, of course, knowing the doubts about the demonstration on the part of the Chinese leaders refrained from that. But he was definitely rooting for them, and he was definitely shocked and dismayed when the crackdown in Tiananmen Square came. But, but he, he, he was diplomatic in that he did not criticize the Chinese government, but you write that he learned a critical lesson that informed his thinking yes. about how to handle the popular uprisings that were coming in Eastern Europe. Yes, a few weeks or months later, similar demonstrations occurred in Eastern Europe. And if he had ever had any thought of crushing them, which I don't think he did, the spectacle of what happened in Tiananmen Square persuaded him that this must never happen at his orders in Eastern Europe. You know, I, I, the, the, you said, uh, so you were, uh, you gave the McGinty lecture at Salve Regina University last night. Uh, you, at one point you, you noted that there were, you don't think that there was anybody else in the Politburo at the time that Gorbachev became premier that would have done what he did. 
does that mean that if there had not been a Gorbachev, we'd still be in the first Cold War? Well, how many years has it been since 1985? Uh, I think a lot of people would say, and I would say, that if there had been no Gorbachev, they would have muddled on trying to make the old system work with minor reforms. They chose him to make what they expected to be moderate reforms, and he shocked them by trying to transform the country. So if he wasn't there, they would have muddled ahead 5, 10, 15, 20 years, who knows, and then there would have been probably an explosion, much bigger than happened when the system collapsed. When the system collapsed, there was some blood, but not much by historical standards of when an empire collapses. So it, maybe it would eventually have exploded. Uh, the, the leaders of the, of the Soviet Union would have been executed like Ceausescu in Romania. Russia and Ukraine might have had a war like the one in Yugoslavia. We know they've had one, but nothing like the bloodbath in Yugoslavia. Yeah. So that's my guess as to what would have happened without Gorbachev. We've got about 15 seconds left. Uh, do you, uh, what's, what's Gorbachev, what's his life like now? Well, he's hated in his own country, and that must be very painful for him. And he's alone. His wife died in 1999, and his daughter has moved largely to Germany. He's not well. One feels sorry for him, but he's been such an optimist that his last book is titled, I Remain an Optimist. We need to leave it there. Bill Taubman, <laughs> the book is Gorbachev, His Life and Times. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us next time for more Story in the Public Square.